when we do this report now, we will try to come out to the countries and take a few countries. We can do it in all the over 50 countries that we have, but at least start testing some of the uh, uh, hypotheses that we have in the report in a few countries. And if they work, then we will be able to sort of take them uh, uh, to a global basis. The total GDP of our continent today is $2.3 trillion. Your, this report tells you that we can at least increase our GDP uh, and co tax collection from 12 to 22 percent. So that is about $230 billion. If you unpack $230 billion, it essentially means that by bettering our tax collection efforts, we can power Africa. By bettering our tax collection efforts, we can actually finally build the famous Cape to Cairo road, which will connect our continent. By bettering our tax collection efforts, we can actually essentially ensure that every woman and child on the continent has access to good health care because we just did a report that said all we need is $66 billion. So I think that the, the key of the report is essentially saying, yes, we do need to go out and raise additional resources for our development, but that if we made the effort, we are rich enough. If we made the effort, we have enough resources on the continent to be able to power our economy. We are a decade away from Agenda 2030, from achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. And we always say there is a financing gap. We've estimated the financing gap in the report at about $630 billion. I gave you the lower end of the bar. The report says we can increase it from 12% to 22%. If we only did the 12%, we are at 230 billion. If we did the 22%, we would be at 460 billion. So if we became that ambitious, we could do really well. One of the ways of becoming that ambitious is of course through the digital age. We have seen, I think, amazing experiences and amazing examples. And I think back to your comment, you know, Rwanda has been able to increase its tax to GDP ratios by 6% because of digitization. And when we talk about digitization, we don't talk about it for the sake of it. For us to get to Agenda 2030, we, we must get there with the private sector. We cannot get there as the public sector. So the public sector is going to lead, but the private sector is going to be leveraged 20%, 30%. For that to happen, digitization ensures that time, to, time it takes to pay taxes drops. South Africa has done that by 22%. They have saved processes and procedures. Sometimes people don't pay taxes, not because they don't want to, but because it takes 380 days. If you were only paying taxes, you would not run your business. So we need to be able to bring that down, bring those numbers down. South Africa has brought them down to half a day. I think that all of us can do that. And by doing that, we actually re increase our tax collection efforts. This is what the report is talking about. I think the beauty of the report is that it also uses African examples. So you can go to your neighbors, you can go to South Africa, you can go to Rwanda, you can go to uh, 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 Uganda. You can, so the, the examples are within reach. We are not giving you examples of what Singapore has done. Eventually we would want to do better than Singapore. We, but I think that when you look at what Morocco has done, we can es essentially begin to say we can get there and we can get there well. We are sitting in a country today, Morocco, that has a tax to GDP ratio of about 25%. But they are actually reducing the VAT from 25% uh, to 17% and the tax on societies from 17 to 10, which means that de decrease can actually get better if you improve collection and if you improve administration. So there are some good examples that you can actually look at across the globe. The importance of this report for us, and the team has worked really hard, and I, I, again, I take uh, 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 the cue from our, uh, our last speaker from Sudan. You, I don't know if you have in front of you, but I had asked the team as we were working on the report to produce a sheet of the data gaps. And yes, we are discussing fiscal policy and how you do fiscal policy and whether you're doing counter-cyclical or pro-cyclical. But if we cannot get the data, we cannot do the analysis in the way that it can. And I think that in 2019, as African countries, we cannot say that we do not have the right fiscal data to do the right analysis. So if there is only one thing that we take away from here, let us at least pledge that when we meet in six months, not in one year, in six months, this sheet will now be filled by every country and we will have the data because you collect the data. 
And if you don't, our colleagues from the African Statistics Center hopefully will be able to come out and help you collect that data so we can work together on it. Because if we don't have the right data, we cannot make the right policies. And I think that that's the first message from this report is let's get the data. The second message from the report is once we have the data, we can actually do good policy. We, have the, we now know where to look, we now know what to look. I think the beautiful thing about the report is it gives us options. It's either you're doing counter cyclical uh, fiscal policy options, you're changing your tax base. Many of us are not taxing agriculture or property rights. Or for our revenue and resource rich countries, maybe we're looking at base erosion and saying, you know, can we stop price shifting and can we create? In many of our countries today, we do actually have the office for large taxpayer services and for mining, but they're not open and they're not effective. Can we do that? So I think it doesn't, it's not a one size fits all, we acknowledge that. And I think that our teams are now willing and ready to come out to you and see which part of, you know, the policy options, there are five of them. Collectively, some of you will do two, some of you will do three. ECA has just launched a digital center of excellence. We are already beginning to work on how you combine the digital age with the fiscal policy uh, environment. So we will be very happy and very willing to come out and see how you can bring those two things together to ensure that uh, we improve our revenue collection. If we do not improve revenue collection on the continent, we will not make the SDGs. So I think this is the story of how we move forward on that. The good news is, and I think it's impossible to have a meeting in, the, in, in, in Africa today without talking about the CFTA, and I just see that the Minister for Ethiopia has joined me. Hi, how are you? Uh, you are our last ratifying country. Let's give them a round of uh, applause. I think as we, would, uh, as we look at physical policy, there's always a question about does trade and does the CFTA reduce tax collection? We have collectively done a, a study at the ECA that shows no, on the contrary. What is going to happen is we're going to trade more, we're going to collect more taxes because there's going to be more business. But the IMF has also done a study that shows the same, it has the same result that actually the CFTA, global regional value chains, are actually fiscal policy enhancing, revenue enhancing policies. So I think it all just demonstrates that as a continent we're going in the right direction. If we put in place the right governance systems and governance and leadership are the most important parts of the story, we will be able to meet Agenda 2030 and the goal is not as ambitious as we think. On that note, I thank everybody for coming and um, say that we're hoping that you would invite us to your country to come and see now how we actually put the results of this report into being and into action and have a lot more African countries that are hitting the 25% tax to GDP ratios. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Vera, I would like to thank all of you for uh, contributing to this important discussion on fiscal policy for financing sustainable development in Africa. First of all, I would like to commend ECA for a very commendable work on the economic report on Africa. The team is uh, very important and it will help guide African governments to fine-tune their efforts in terms of domestic resource mobilization. Fiscal, pol fiscal policy is a very important macroeconomic instrument the government has in terms of uh, domestic resource mobilization, improving quality of spending, and as well as debt management as well. Uh, it is the only way we can sustainably finance our development goals to transform our economies and to create jobs and to inclusive growth. Therefore, domestic resource mobilization is fundamental for uh, all of us, African government, and uh, that is the only way we can own our development to sustainably finance our uh, very important macroeconomic and development objectives. In Ethiopia, we, we gave uh, a very important focus on domestic resource mobilization recently as part of the broader reform in the economic sector that we are undergoing recently to unleash the potentials of the private sector and also fine-tuning the role of the government in the whole uh, development effort. Interministerial team has been established to increase domestic resource mobilization. The potential of resource mobilization is very huge, but the current is, uh, is, not, is short of uh, what we have to collect in terms of tax to GDP ratio and uh, therefore we are working to address these gaps. Uh, the team is working on, uh, on fine-tuning and uh, reformulating 
various legislations regarding tax and domestic revenue mobilization. And definitely this year's uh, economic report on Africa on fiscal policy for finance for development, which give us on fiscal options, on tax policy options, and on non-tax revenue options, as well as on tax administration options, and also on policy options for natural resource sector, as well as also on the role of digitization on enhanced revenue mobilization. It is very important analytical work. <coughs> and we are already in discussion with uh, Vera that we need ECA to work with us closely on how to use the recommendations of this report to reflect and analyze to the challenges and opportunities we face at country level in Ethiopia in particular. Therefore, it's very commendable work to, to help us a lot on analytically how to improve our effort on domestic resource mobilizations. And today's discussions and contributions from uh, various excellencies as well as also distinguished uh, panelists and discussants are very important that will facilitate for us to learn from each other to improve on our fiscal policy to sustainable development, inclusive growth and job creation as well. Thank you very much. They deserve a round of applause for a job well done. I think what has been re echoed, the bottom line is, as the executive secretary said, bettering our tax collection. By definition, fiscal policy is a combination of borrowing, spending, and taxation. Now, we are talking about fiscal space. There is confusion in this sense, depending on the school of thought. We have different experts coming into the country, in our continent, telling us this is what is sustainable, this is not what is sustainable. We're just looking at some statistics. You look at Singapore, their debt GDP ratio, they haven't defaulted, and it's so high. You go to Guatemala, they only have 10% and they've defaulted. That I will leave um, the, the, the audience to debate maybe at another time. But I think the bottom line, I, I, I think I'm provoking a very, very interesting uh, debate here. May, maybe we will not close now. We will <laughs> extend for another 10 minutes. Um, Mr. Lowe, Mubarak Lowe complained the evaluation of Senegal, um, ranking them in doing business. I think Gambia also, we also have the same complaint. Maybe we can have a solution. Maybe we can say that if these sort of forms we can fill in. Maybe ECA can serve as a one-stop shop. That if information like this is going to be requested, because sometimes this information they're getting on doing business in Africa, maybe they just go to one or two companies and they collect data. It's the methodology they use. And I, and I think we can... Huh? Okay, okay. I, I, I think maybe at another forum, this is a subject matter that is affecting us. It's about perception. I remember Gambia, we had a problem with an American company, and I think the following week, Forbes magazine came up with an article saying Gambia is the second worst country doing business in Africa. So it's, it's linked. And there was nothing tangible, no evidence showing that what happened. But because of this sort of information that is going back, but if we use our own institution, ECA, credible with integrity, I, I think we can maybe come up with some sort of a resolution, maybe at the AU level, to say that information like this, you cannot go country to country, but it is also our responsibility to make sure that we provide the information not only credible, but also timely to prove um, ECA. Here I'm talking about the municipalities. I think municipalities continent-wide, I, I think... The, the, these are figures, these are statistics that at the government, at the macroeconomic level, we don't gather. But they are eyesores, really. I, I, I think if we can also look into the behavior and the performance of our municipalities, the responsibilities that they're supposed to take over. Maybe these are things that we of even reducing at the macroeconomic level the, the expenditure, the, the electricity, the water, all of these things, they will always say that it's not their responsibility. I, I, I think these are issues that at another forum we should be able to address. On that note, I respectfully salute the team um, of ECA, and I hope we will be able to have another session
where whatever is being discussed today, we have provoked many thoughts, and I hope we will be able to deepen and uh, come up with something much more tangible, much more evidence in order to help finance ministers make informed decision. On that note, I thank you very much, and I wish you all the best. All the best. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll be easy. I, I, I think she, she wants to answer one uh, issue that I raised and then she'll also give her closing remarks. She's my minister from the Gambia. We used to work a lot together, so I'm very, very happy to see you again. This is really great. Um, two things I think that he mentioned in terms of debt and uh, 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 ratios and different countries, I think. It's not so much the debt level, it is also the debt level that matters, but it is also sometimes interest payments. So when you look at Nigeria, Nigeria's debt to GDP is 20%, interest payments are 35% of their expenditure, which means there's no fiscal space. So in some sense, what we look at are the two numbers. We look at the level debt to GDP. If you look at Italy, Italy's debt to GDP is 110%. It's only local currency, so it doesn't really matter. They're just owing themselves inside their country and they don't owe anybody, so they can't go bankrupt. And that's probably the example. When you have high numbers and you're not going bankrupt, it's because you just owe yourself. If you have 70% and it's all in dollars and you owe somebody else, then you have to pay. And you could actually go bankrupt. So I think when we look at debt to GDP, we look at both what is your debt to GDP, but also in what currency is it denominated? That's one part of it. And the second part of it is, of course, how much of the taxes that you collect are you putting to pay in the debt? And so in a country like Nigeria, I don't want to go to another country, I think. Which one did you mention? Colombia? Yeah, Guatemala. Guatemala. I don't, I don't know what the numbers in Guatemala are, but probably what is happening in Guatemala is that they have no fiscal space because 30%, over a third of all the taxes they collect, is being used to service their debt, and which means that eventually it's not sustainable. So I think those are the two, and so sometimes when we look at those comparisons, we need to unpack it a little bit to see what exactly it is that we are talking about when we talk about debt to GDP. It is a big problem. But without further ado, I think we've heard all the messages on the report. I want to, um, um, like you, join uh, my name to really, really thank the team. Um, I know that uh, Adam and his team have put a lot of effort into this uh, with your help giving us the data and I come back to the data but uh, maybe I don't know who is here from the team maybe you guys should stand up let's because uh, they haven't slept so they haven't slept for two three weeks so please just stand up let's thank you for uh, Um, I think in closing is really to say again, the good news of the report is we can do it. The good news of the report is we know how to do it. The good news of the report is there is support if you decide that you want to do it. So it's left to us and um, as we say, it's impossible until it's done. We have countries on the continent that are at 35%, 30% uh, revenue to GDP. This is what the East Asians did to get to 10% growth. We are at 3.2% growth. It's no miracle. If we stay at 3.2% growth, we will not get to Agenda 2030. We will not create the jobs we need. 16 million jobs a year that we need on the continent to ensure that we can do this. So I think that the, the challenge is launched. But it's not such a big challenge because we know we can do it. And the, 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 the issue is do we make that commitment and that pledge that we will move forward from here and do it as we should. ECA at least, I think, is ready and willing to commit to coming to Sudan, coming to the Gambia, coming to Ethiopia to work with you. Uh, but before I close, since our chairperson of the Bureau is here and I keep talking about all of what Morocco is doing, Maybe I just hand over to Morocco for two minutes, if you agree, Chair People. I ask, ask your permission. Uh, Mr. Shafi, s'il vous plaît, merci. Merci, Madame la Secrétaire exécutive, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. Ministre. Je voulais juste, bien sûr, féliciter mes amis de la sueur pour la qualité du rapport, mais je voulais aussi juste ouvrir et élargir la perspective. Euh, quand on parle de budget d'État et de marge de manœuvre budgétaire, et sur la question fiscale et centrale, avoir un système fiscal performant et des impôts bien construits qui permettent effectivement le meilleur retournement à travers une, une assiette d'argent. 
Mais la prévention personne ne peut pas s'arrêter à ce niveau. Il faut agir sur l'ensemble des leviers possibles, dans l'expérience marocaine, un élément qui a été important dans notre parcours, ça a été aussi le traitement de la sphère publique, l'ensemble des établissements publics, qui parfois sont une charge, et comment faire pour la rationalisation de la réforme du secteur public, aussi générer des recettes, y compris dans une séquence de privatisation. Le Maroc a eu des recettes de l'ordre de 8 milliards de dollars. Il y a des opérations de privatisation qui n'ont pas été utilisées dans les dépenses de fonctionnement et dont la moitié des recettes a été dans un fonds d'investissement. Et je vois un effet, un effet de levier qui a rendu possible un certain nombre d'opérations qui étaient inenvisageables. À un moment donné, on a eu une capacité de financement de l'infrastructure grâce à ce fonds d'investissement. Donc la dimension privatisation est une dimension importante qu'il faut aussi avoir dans l'agenda là où c'est possible. Quand on parle de fiscalité, souvent on parle de trois types d'impôts, les trois principaux impôts, l'impôt sur le revenu, l'impôt sur les sociétés, la TVA, mais aussi les taxes intérieures de consommation. Il y a un lien important, la fiscalité sur le tabac, sur les produits énergétiques, sur un certain nombre de jeux. Quand vous, prenez, quand vous consommez cette, cette bouteille, j'ai ici un marquage. Je sais chaque bouteille produite à la limite produite qui l'a produit. Et donc j'ai une assiette maîtrisée. Là aussi, il y a des enjeux importants. Il y a des trucs très importants de recettes dans un certain nombre de pays parce que c'est pas suffisamment maîtrisé. Et puis quand on parle d'endettement, bien sûr, il y a des ratios. Mais là aussi, comme j'ai dit l'autre jour, il n'y a pas de dogme. Ce sont des pays en voie de développement. Quand je vois le ratio moyen de 50%, on peut avoir plus d'endettement. Mais encore faut-il avoir les moyens du financement d'endettement. Et donc, plus vous développez vos marchés de capitaux, plus vous donnez à l'État la possibilité de se financer en dehors d'un financement bancaire qui exerce un effet d'édition sur l'économie. Et plus vous aurez des réformes de vos régimes de pension, de retraite, vous pouvez être en situation d'émettre des banques du Trésor avec un marché qui gagne en profondeur, parce que le banque du Trésor devient un instrument liquide qui permet aux opérateurs de faire un certain nombre de... de plus vous développez ces instruments, plus vous améliorez vos marques d'endettement de, 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 et de capacité d'endettement sans effet d'édiction, sans que le financement de l'État ne porte préjudice à l'économie. C'est là où il faut se le bon usage. Et puis après, bien entendu, plus vous avez des politiques macroéconomiques saines, plus vous êtes en situation d'aller vers des agences de notation, plus vous pouvez capter les financements internationaux à travers des sorties sur les marchés. Donc en fait, le spectre est très large et c'est ces actions plurielles qui permet de donner de nouvelles marges à l'État et pour la question des IDE, l'expérience marocaine montre que la question fiscale n'est pas déterminée. Pendant 50 années, Tanger, la région du nord du Royaume, bénéficiait d'une fiscalité de forme importante sur le reste du pays. On avait un taux d'IS qui était de moitié inférieur au taux national. Il n'y a pas eu d'investissement pour autant. Mais quand nous avons mis le port à Tanger, quand on a mis l'autoroute, et quand on a mis la zone industrielle, et quand on a mis l'environnement des investissements, aujourd'hui nous n'arrivons plus à suivre la demande. La zone industrielle de Tanger s'est densifiée en 4 ans, et eu 400 entreprises qui sont installées. Donc c'est aussi l'environnement, c'est l'infrastructure, c'est la logistique qui sont déterminants. La fiscalité est un atout, mais dans toutes les enquêtes que nous faisons, elle vient au Maroc en 7 e place, quand on s'adresse aux investisseurs qui s'intéressent à nous. Ce qui est en première place, c'est la lutte contre la corruption, c'est la gouvernance, c'est les facilités, c'est la clarté de la règle et le respect de la règle. Je vous remercie.